Uh, actually, we started a series last week entitled, This is What We Do. And, and today we're going to continue in that series by looking at a theme uh, that I really want to kind of set up by, by giving you or telling you this story. There's a story told of a husband and wife who go to the doctors one day for a... But it does reveal to us in so many ways human nature, that, that in our lives we can often see, we can often know, we can recognize that there are needs in, in the lives of those around us, there are needs that are present in our world, and yet so often our knee-jerk reaction, our, 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 our approach to that is, I, I don't really want to do anything about that, I, I don't want to get involved, I, I'm too busy. We kind of have this idea of, I'm not doing that. Right? In fact, let's just for fun, would you just, would you just touch the person sitting next to you? Would you just touch them and say, I'm not doing that? Go ahead and j just say that. And for those of you that are like, I'm not doing that, that's stupid. Thank you for proving my point. Right? Be because, because in so many ways, this is what happens. We say, listen, I see these needs, but I'm not doing that. And yet what's interesting to me is when we read Scripture and we look at the life of Jesus... What we see time and time again, by which Jesus lived his life and taught those of us who are his followers to live as well. We, we talked last week of how Jesus forgave without limits. Next week, we're going to talk about how Jesus over and over again welcomed without judgment. Today, we're going to talk about this theme. We're going to see in the Gospel of John, chapter 13, that Jesus shows us an example of loving without conditions. Jesus loved without condition. If you have your Bibles or you're following along version Live or you're looking at the screens, let, let's look at the text. John chapter 13, beginning in verse 1, says this. It was just before the Passover feast, and Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So I want to pause here for a second. And let me kind of unpack this a little bit, okay? Here's what we know. Jesus was fully God and fully man, so he knew what was about to come. That this is the final week of Jesus' life. This, it all started with him riding into Jerusalem on the donkey as they sang, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed be the name of the Lord, praising him. But now it's Thursday evening, and Jesus knows in just a few short hours he is going to go to the cross for all of humanity. And so he has decided he wants to gather to himself his close friends, his disciples, the guys that he has done life with, the people that he has invested in for all of these years. And he decides to have kind of a private meal with them. We know it as kind of a historical meal. We call it the Last Supper or the Lord's Supper where he, first time, we see Jesus breaking bread and saying, this is my body which is broken for you. Taking the cup, saying, this is the cup, the new covenant in my blood. And so he's having this moment, knowing very well that in just a few short hours, he is going to be arrested. He's going to be falsely accused. He is going to be put on trial. He's going to be convicted. He's going to be whipped and beaten and abused. What happens? Well, according to Luke's gospel, we see that an argument breaks out among the disciples. All of a sudden, in the, in, the, in the beauty of this moment with Jesus, these last and final hours, his disciples start acting essentially like two-year-olds, right? They, they're, they're having this big argument over who's the greatest among them. Now, the, the scriptures don't tell us how it played out, so allow, allow me to indulge just a little bit, because maybe it went something like this. Someone said, I wonder which one of us is the greatest, to which somebody else we don't know says, it has to be me, for some generic reason. 
To which I imagine that if this is how it played out, John said this, no, 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 you have it wrong. You know it's me because I'm the one that he says that he loves. To which Peter said, no, 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 listen, John, you're, you're mistaken because I'm the one. It has to be me because I'm the only one that had enough faith to step out of the boat. Remember that day, the storm? I stepped out of the boat. I walked on the water while the rest of you jokers stayed in the boat because you weren't, you weren't so sure about this thing, right? It has to be me, which to, to, I imagine that Matthew responded saying, look, look, Peter, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Remember, you sunk. <laughs> right? I mean, I mean, they're having this big discussion over who is the greatest, and they have all these reasons in their mind as to why it's them. In this moment where Jesus is trying to have this, this special time with them. And so I imagine, I imagine as this is happening, as this is unfolding, Jesus is sitting there thinking to himself, I've already told you who the greatest is. I've already told you that the greatest among you is the one who is willing to serve the greatest among you is the one who's willing to lay their life down for another. And so as Jesus is watching this unfold, here's, here's what we see according to the text. Jesus looks at them and he, he sees their proud hearts. That they're having this big discussion, wanting to know who the greatest is. And at the same time, he sees their dirty feet. He, he sees their proud hearts, how they're, they're fixated and stuck so many times on the wrong things. And he sees their dirty feet. And so what does Jesus do? He does what in that day was culturally unacceptable for him. Was going to blow their mind. What does it say? Look at the text. If you have your Bibles, continue with me in verse 4. It says this. So Jesus got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around them, around him. Let, let, let's kind of unpack that a little bit because what you have to understand is happening here is actually something that was a, a rather common courtesy in Jesus' day. Okay, the washing of feet was something that was common practice. It would be kind of the equivalent of you coming over to my house and let's pretend like it's January and it's cold. Okay, praise God for 60. I'm not complaining, okay? But let's just pretend that, that it's cold outside and I, as you come into my house, I might say, can I take your coat? Can I hang it up for you? Or maybe something that's more appropriate to this weather. If you were to come over to my house, I might say, would you like something to drink because you're warm, right? That, that's a very common courtesy in our day. In first century Jewish culture, the way it would play out is this. If you invited somebody over to your house, the first thing that would happen is the host would greet you with a kiss on the cheek. Kind of like we might do a hug. Hey, good to see you. And then he would say, would you like your feet to be washed? Now, it's very important to note that in that culture, it would never be the host that was washing the person's feet. It would always be somebody else. Washing of feet was reserved for the lowest of the low in society. Essentially, when the host is offering, he's, he's taking this as a moment to almost be a little prideful and say, look at me, I, I'm so good to you. I've provided this person to wash your feet. Now, now here's the question. Why was that reserved for the lowest of the low? And the answer is actually kind of obvious. Because feet are nasty. Right? I mean, let's just, let's just be real. In our culture, in our society, with shoes and with socks and all of that, feet are still nasty. But in first century Jewish culture, with open-toed sandals and dirt roads and livestock that are living and moving through the market square, doing their business, maybe splashing that business on your feet, right? Or you happen to get bumped in the crowd and you step in a pile of it. You know, I get a little upset when I go outside and I step in the, the small little pile of my Boston Terrier, right? I'll tell you, it was a whole nother level of nasty when we used to have a Great Dane, Right? <laughs> But, but, but this is what's happening. It, it's nasty because look at the cultural context. And so what's so amazing here is this, that knowing that, knowing the culture and knowing the setting, what does Jesus do? Jesus sees their proud hearts. He sees their dirty feet. And he says, I'm going to show them an example of what love without condition looks like. And he gets up from the meal and he puts on the servant apron and he puts some water in a bowl, and he begins to wash their feet. Now, you have to understand that when Jesus did that, 
the disciples would have been in shock. They would have been like, wait, 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 wait. What is going on here? Because I know that that imagery still can kind of be lost on us. So let me, let me try to do the best I can to illustrate what that would look like. It would be like asking the President of the United States to come over to your house and him offering, when he gets there, he's saying, can I scrub the dirt? You know that gook that builds up on the bottom of your kitchen garbage can? I would like to, you would, you would never let that happen, right? It'd be like asking the Queen of England over to your house and having her say, can I scrub your toilets? Listen, nobody's ever going to allow that to happen, ever, right? So this is how shocking it is for the disciples, because think about it. This is Jesus. This is God in the flesh. This is the Prince of Peace, the Wonderful Counselor, the Bread of Life, the Living Water, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the creator and sustainer of all things. And what is he doing? He's stepping down and he's humbling himself, and he's doing what everybody else in that room would have said, I'm not doing that. Which shows us such a beautiful picture of love without condition. That even in the midst of their discussion, their argument over who's the greatest, even in the midst of their focus being in the wrong direction at that hour in Jesus' life, he still loved them to the end. He never stopped loving them. Can I just take a little side note for a second? I came to tell somebody today, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter how many mistakes you've made. God still loves you. He loves you to the end. He knows your name. He knows your struggle. He knows your hurts. He knows your pain. And his response to you is always the same. It is unconditional love forever and ever and ever. I don't know who that's for, but I want you to know today, God loves you with an eternal love and it never ceases. He loved them to the end, and he did what all of them would have said was the unthinkable, which got me thinking today, actually really this week, and, and I really felt God challenged me with this thought, be, because like you, I can be going about my life, and I, I can see and maybe notice needs and think to myself, I'm too busy, I got to get here, I got to go there, I got to do that, Right? And I really felt like God speak to me as I was studying this text and say, here's what I want you to begin to pray. Now listen, I'm not much for New Year's resolutions. Any New Year's resolution people? No, God bless you, you're like me. All right, I, I don't need another indicator in my life that I messed up or I didn't complete something that I promised, okay? I got enough of those, all right? So I don't do the New Year's resolution thing. But, but in many ways, you, you can almost say a, a resolution in my life that God has been challenging me with is this. To when I see a need that I actually can do something about, to ask God, is this the assignment that you have for me today? I've been really challenging and trying to train myself to pray. God, give me eyes to see the needs of those around me. Give me ears to hear the cries of the hurting. And give me a heart that actually cares enough to do something about it. Because let's just be honest, okay? We can be so caught up in our lives that we, we, we don't pay attention to those things, right? We, we, we can so often love with these conditions. Like for example, maybe your friend calls you up and says, hey, you know what, I gotta move out of my house and I could really use some help and immediately the condition co comes in, right? Well, but I have all of these other things to do, right? And yet we could maybe look at it from this perspective and say, yeah, but people help me move so I could go help others. Or maybe we could come into church service like this and we could see that the garbage can is overflowing because somebody hasn't gotten to it yet. And we could think, somebody needs to clean up my church. Don't you know I like to go to a clean church? Or we could say, you know what? I could take some trash out. I'm not above collecting the garbage and running it down to the, to the dumpster. I mean, after all, I got this Fitbit thing for Christmas. I need to rack up some points on it, right? <laughs> or, or maybe we could come into church and we could see, and I, I'm just talking in the context of the church because that's kind of my world, okay? So just work with me. 
But we could come into church and we could see that maybe one or two or more of the services, we could use some volunteers with, with people to pray for others after the service or, or, or people to help connect people with resources after they've given their life to Christ or maybe have some more people in the VIP area to just give a smile and a gift to the people who've never been here before, answer some questions or maybe a greeter at the door or maybe an usher as people are coming in and, and we could come in and we can have the mindset, yeah, but you don't understand, Chris, like I just want to get my Jesus thing in, I'm going to get my church groove on and get home. I mean, I, I really only want to be there for like an hour. I mean, after all, I got things to do. It's nice. I need to get to the park. I need to get home, the crock pot is cooking, and the Steelers are on, and I understand that it's a big game. I get it. I get it. And we're all praying that something happens to Tom Brady before this afternoon. Okay? But I'm not so sure God really cares about that. Anyway, my point being, right? I mean, he might care for Brady, but I don't know that he cares who wins, okay? But my, my point is this. We could come and just try to check off our little church box and say, okay, I did my church thing. Or we could say, you know what? I remember a time when I needed someone to stand with me in prayer. And there were people there to serve me. I could serve by praying. Or I remember a time when I came to church and I had had one of those weeks. You know what I mean? H-E double hockey sticks weeks. And if that offends you, I didn't say the word, okay? Okay. We can say it in all other contexts, but just not that one. Anyway. But, but I came in, and, and, and the greeter that met me at the door was the only person that said, you know, it's really good to see you today. That's the only person that's ever said that to me all week long. Or, or maybe I remember being the, the first-time guest. And you know how it is when you're new, and there's all these people, and it's like, I don't know what's going on. But I remember there were VIP people there to give me a gift and give me a smile and make me feel welcome. And I can do that. See, see, so often we see needs in our lives. There are needs that are prevalent. There are needs that are there. But we can so easily fall into that category of saying, I'm not doing that. I'm, I'm not a garbage person. Well, maybe today you could be. I'm not a mover. But today I could be. I'm not somebody who, who, who's a volunteer, but today I could be. See, we have an opportunity to follow the example of our God and Savior who loved us unconditionally. And we have an opportunity to show that love in everything that we do. And when we do that, we get the privilege of seeing what God can do through our lives. So I want you to understand, when you serve and you use your gifts and you use your talents, whether it be at this church or anywhere, ministry doesn't just happen on this stage. I'm not the only person that ministers on a Sunday morning. I like to tell our volunteers, ministry starts on the corner, on the street, like long before anybody ever gets in here. Ministry starts with handing somebody a bulletin. Ministry starts with saying hello. You and I are all called to minister. And can I just get on a soapbox for a second? I don't know why I ask you guys these things, because I do it anyways, but (laughs) I guess I'm trying to be polite. But but here's the thing. We, We don't need... Or shouldn't only do ministry when somebody's got their phone out to take a picture of it so they can post it on Instagram with the hashtag honored to serve. Right? It's not about just serving so we can say, look what I'm doing. Look how I'm loving. Look how I'm caring. Right? Because here's, here's the bottom line. It's not about your gifts. It's not about your talents. It's not about you and I getting the recognition. It is about glorifying God. It's about connecting people to a God that loves them. It's about making a difference in their life as God has made a difference in your life and he uses you to make a difference in their life. Amen. That's what it's about. In, in fact, here's just a big thought. You want to write this down? You'll make me feel good about myself. It'll be nice. We got these new, oh, you don't have one. We got these new bulletins, right? So there's all this white space on the back. So you can take notes, and if you don't like to take notes, you can just use your pen and pretend. It makes me feel really good. But but here's a big thought. You ready? Serving isn't just what we do. Servants are who we are. Love isn't just something that we do or should do. Love is who we are. Why? 
Because here's the beautiful picture of God. Love isn't just what God does. He doesn't just love us when we do the right things. He doesn't just love us when he feels like it. He doesn't just love us when we're faithful to him. Love is who he is. That's why God can love us when we are unfaithful. That's why God continues to love us when we don't do the right things. That's why we can say that the love of God is eternal because when love is who you are, then love is what you do. I, I, I will kind of give you an example of what I'm talking about without sounding braggadocious or making it all about me, but I, I have to tell you that, that my, my, my daughters, God has blessed Carrie and I with four amazing daughters. And it's been so cool to see, especially the older two, as they are kind of growing up and becoming young adults, that, to see how they are consistently, they're not perfect, but they are consistently making decisions in line with saying, I want my life to be all about Jesus. It, it's been super cool. And, and, and yet recently, th- this is kind of interesting for me because I don't often view myself as, as being old enough to have these conversations, right? But, but recently, a younger couple came to me and said, Pastor Chris, what is your trick? Like, what's your secret in having kids turn out the way that your kids have turned out? And, and I'll be honest with you, my, my initial reaction was almost like, I don't know, I got lucky. It's their mom. Yes. Right? It's their mom. But there you go. But I did, I did, I did think about that this week. And, and you know, I have two big theories on this. And, and I will tell you, this is beyond just raising kids. This really affects every relationship that we have. Here, here's my two big theories. Number one. If you want people in your life to be passionate about Jesus, they need to see you passionate about Jesus. You know, it's, not, it's not some big trick of getting people to, to follow Christ. Re- really, passion is contagious, right? When they see you passionate about Jesus, I'm going to tell you right now. I leaned over, where's Frank? There he is. I leaned over during worship and I said, this is why we do church. He's like, what do you mean? You know how Paul said, do not forsake the coming together? We don't come together because it's a religious requirement. We don't come together because we have to. We come together because we get to. And when we look around and we see other people who are lifting their hands in worship to God, when I see you worshiping God, you know what that does in me? It encourages me. It builds my faith when I know some of your stories and I've seen where God has brought you from to where you are today. And I see how even in your pains and your struggles and your difficulties, you still can lift your hands and say, listen, faith doesn't mean that my problems go away. Faith just gives me the strength to fight and I lift my hands and I'm worshiping God because he is and I know he is and because he will continue to be that builds our faith. I don't even know, that wasn't in my notes either, but whatever. I don't know, this is like the random message, okay? If you wanted a nice, succinct message, you came to the wrong service. But what I'm saying is when we are passionate about Jesus, it creates passion in others. In fact, let, let me take that one step further. I understand the value and the importance of a personal relationship with Jesus. Let let me just be clear. You can't ride grandma's shirt tails to heaven. Okay? It's got to be a faith of your own. Right? We we all had those grandmas or those grandpaps, right, that that were like the faith rock of our family. And that's good. And many of us are where we are today with God because of their prayers. But you have to have it personal. I get that. But you know what else I'm learning as I grow in my relationship with God? You also need a shared faith in God. Because here's what happens. When we share our faith, when when we are open and we are passionate and we model the passion that we have for God, it creates passion and it creates hunger in others. I've seen it in my own life. I've been through times when I am down and I am discouraged And yet there's been this overwhelming peace that God has given me in the midst of it. And people will say, how is that possible? How do you have peace when your world is falling apart? And I get the opportunity to say, it's a peace that passes my understanding because it's not mine, it's God's. How do you have joy? Because joy in my life is not based on the happenings. Happiness is based on happenings. 
But joy is based on an eternal God who says, I am always with you. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Never will I turn my back on you. We want people to be passionate about Jesus. We need to be passionate about Jesus. Which leads to the second big theory. If we want people to be hungry and passionate about serving God, then we need to be hungry and passionate about serving God. Right? We, we need to model that service. In fact, I will just say this for the record. I firmly believe, and I believe the scriptures can back it up, that every single one of us have been gifted and talented by God, that they are unique gifts and unique talents that God has deposited in your life that he wants you to use for his glory, for his honor, for his purposes. And listen to me, I don't care how old you are. I don't care if you're in sixth grade or you're 150. If that can even happen, praise God for you, right? But you have a purpose, and you are valuable. And when you understand that your gifts and your talents and your abilities are something that God can use to make a difference in somebody else's life, you know what happens? What happens is all of a sudden, it's not I have to go to church. It's I get to go to church. It's not I have to love Jesus. It's that I get to love Jesus. It's not I have to serve other people. It's that I get to serve other people and see how God can use a broken, messed up person like me who doesn't always get it right, but how God can use me in spite of me, come on somebody, to make a difference in somebody else's life for his glory. I'm telling you, when we are passionate, it will create passion. When we are hungry to serve, it'll create the desire to serve in others. In fact, in, in our life, my life personally, I, I was reminded of this with my daughter, Ireland. For those of you who know, Ireland is our third daughter, and, and she often will help Madison, who is our oldest daughter, run the media. All the stuff that you see on the screens, that's my two girls and our creative department, but my girls run most of those services, okay? And so there was, uh, it was actually New Year's Eve, and Madison had some other obligation that she needed to be at, so she couldn't be here. And so Ireland was filling in for her. And I remember as we were driving to church, Ireland was saying, Daddy, like, why, why do we do all that? Why is that important? You know, that's just a typical question for a kid. And so I was telling her, I said, listen, babe, that, that is, we don't do it because it's cool. We don't do it because it's like the in thing to do. We, we put the words up there and we have the media because we want to help connect people to Jesus. We want to remove any obstacle or any hurdle that would prevent somebody from being able to fully know the love of the Father and connect with Jesus. And when I said that to her, you could, you could kind of see the sparkle in her eyes. Like, oh man, like, this is important. And so she went up and she got the media ready. And we were about halfway through, some of you were here, you, you know this, we were halfway through the worship set on New Year's Eve and all of a sudden everything on the screens went black. All the technology disappeared and, well, and I'm being the dad that I am, I, I go running upstairs, I'm thinking what, what happened, right? And I get to the top of the stairs and here's my, my daughter Ireland, she's got tears streaming down her face, she's going, Daddy, I don't know what happened. And she's freaking out, and here we discovered that she happened to be sitting in a swivel chair, and when she turned the wrong direction, her foot caught the plug of the computer, and it unplugged it. And so we're scrambling to try to get it all plugged in, and you know how computers are. They take like an eternity to boot up, right? But we're trying to get it all booted up, and, and she's sitting there, and, and I'm seeing that her heart is broken, and I, and I looked at her, and I said, baby, what's the matter? And she goes, daddy, I'm so sorry. She goes, people aren't able to worship Jesus because I messed up. And I will tell you, simultaneously, my heart was broken, and it was a little joyful. Yeah, right. And you're going, what, what do you mean by that? Are you some kind of sicko? No, <laughs> I'm not. But, but, but my heart was broken because I didn't want to see my daughter hurt. But my heart was full of joy because she had caught the purpose. She realized that what she was doing was valuable. It was important, and it mattered. Hear my heart today. You have gifts and talents and abilities that God wants to use that are important, that are valuable, because you matter. You matter to God. See, we, we, don't, we don't serve, we don't love, because it's just what we do. We love because that's who we are. We have been loved and we simply return to others the love that we ourselves have received from a God who loves without condition. 
which brings me to a second big thought. And here, here's what I would say. If you're new with us, or you are somebody who's never put your faith in Jesus Christ, you can just take a break right now. You can just sit back and go, this guy's not talking to me. Okay, you can just, whew, praise Jesus, he's not talking to me right now. Okay, I, I want to talk to those of us who are church people. Th those of us who have maybe been church people for years. Here, here, here's something that can happen in our lives, sometimes without even realizing it. We can begin to, to think that church is all about me. What I can get, how it feeds me, how I can be nourished and how I can grow and how I can do, and, and I'm not saying that that's wrong, but we have to understand that God has not just called us to be spiritual consumers, he has called us to be spiritual contributors. He's never called us to just sit here and come and receive. He always calls us to come, receive, and go and give, right? Because here's the reality. The church does not just simply exist for us. We need to understand that we are the church. The church is not a building. It's not a structure. It's not an institution. The church is we. We, the people, are are the church. I know that sounds a little bit like a political thing, and I'm not trying to be political, okay? But, but we, we are the church, and we exist for our world. What does that mean? Because our lives have been transformed by Jesus. We exist to share that transformation with others. No, we do not transform people. No, we do not convict people. No, we do not save people, but we know the one who does, and we get the opportunity to introduce people to the one who can change their life, the one who can set them free, the one who said, I came to bind up the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, to set people free, to give you life eternal and overflowing forevermore. Amen. And we have an opportunity to share that with others. And here's what I want you to understand. When we do that, when we take what God has deposited in our hearts and we share that with others, God changes lives. God changes lives. But you know what I find fascinating about that? Often the first life that he changes is yours. See, why, why, why do we serve? Why should we serve? I would argue it's because we get the opportunity to see what the all-powerful, almighty God can do through our lives. And so when we do simple things like this, I, I've, I've kind of gotten to this point, I know some people here won't agree with that, okay, but it is what it is, but I spend a lot of time at, at Starbucks it's gotten to the point where I walk in and they're like, hey, Chris, you want your regular? You know, it's, it's pretty funny, right? And I, I, just, I just balance it out like this. Jesus hung out at the well. I hung, hang out at the coffee shop, okay? <laughs> it's very biblical. <laughs> but but in, in the course of these times of spending time at Starbucks, here's, here, here's what I've, I've had the opportunity to do. I've been able to have relationship. I've been able to talk with people. I've developed a relationship with a lot of baristas, okay? And, and now I've, I've kind of gotten to this point in my relationship where, where, where they're like sharing stuff with me. You know, I'm struggling with this. I'm, I'm hurting about this. I don't understand this. And, and a lot of times, most of the time, I mean, some of you are a lot smarter than me. I don't necessarily have the answer, but I can pray. And I, I gotta tell you, the coolest thing that has happened is in my life, I've had the opportunity to say, well, can I just pray with you about that? And as I pray with them, I get to see how God uses my life to encourage, to strengthen to support. See, I want you to understand, when you do things like that, you're ministering to others. Well, when you reach out and you care for people, you know, you say, I'm going to put you before me, and you care for other people, you get to see how God can use you to make a difference. When, when you reach out and you, you help in some regards, right? Maybe like Stacy said, I think that was so beautiful. She says, I want this to be my gift to you, right? I, I want to be here so you get a much deserved and for many parents, much needed break from your kids, especially if you have toddlers. Praise Jesus for you, right? But you get to make a difference in people's lives. In fact, here's what I would say. If you call this church your home and you are not using the gifts and the talents that God has given you, you're robbing yourself of a blessing. You're robbing yourself of the blessing of seeing what God can do in and through your life. 
Because God has a plan and a purpose, and he wants to use you to make a difference in this world. So let me do this as we close. And, and, and you know, if you're regular here, that means we got about 10 more minutes, so hold on. Okay? <laughs> Maybe 15, I heard that. <laughs> it's all good. I want to share with you a couple of examples of individuals that have really showed me the value of this. There, there's, there's a man, and, and, and let me just preface this by saying, if I don't mention your name, please do not take that as I don't value you, okay? I'm not saying that. I don't have time to go through everybody that does something here at this church. But I, I want to point out a couple of people, predominant people that you will know. One, one of them is a guy that you know is Tom, but I call him the chief. And, and the chief, if, if what you don't know about his life, is, is several years ago, he lost his wife Elsie to cancer. And it devastated him. It wrecked him. His family has always been his life. And, and he, after Elsie died and passed away, and we went through all the memorial services, he made a commitment. He's, he actually said this, interestingly enough. It happened as he was having some troubles at his house, and he was having this water break, and he was trying to fix it, and he got it fixed, but he, he said to God, he said, God, I'll tell you what, I'll make you a commitment. If you'll take care of my house, I'll go take care of yours. And so from that day, he began to serve here at the church. And he told me in a conversation we had with him, he said, you know, I, I had the opportunity. I could have just sat at home and, and watched TV and eat ice cream, which let's just all be, the, thank you, Jesus, for ice cream. <laughs> right? <laughs> and he said, I could have just hung out with the boys and maybe ended up at the bar or whatever the case might be. But I decided that I was going to use my time, the time that God had given me, to come and serve at this church. And so for 15 years... Faithfully, Tom has come up here day after day after day. Started with little things, just changing light bulbs and, you know, putting toilet paper on the toilet paper roll. We used to actually have tile floors in here before we had carpet. Funny story about Tom. He has no sense of smell, and so he would come in here and he would bleach the tile floors, and you'd come in here and your eyes would literally burn out of their socket. I mean, it was clean, but it was woo, right? <laughs> But he came up here and he's faithfully served. Now, now that has evolved and that has grown to where he, he doesn't like to be called the leader of it, but we all know that he's the leader of it. He has this little group of men that come up every Thursday and they serve and they do all these little things around the church that need to be done. And recently I was talking to him and I said, you know what, Tom, I, I just want to tell you, thank you so much for your service to this church. What you have done is, has enabled us to continue to move on and grow and do ministry. And you know what he said to me? He looked at me with tears in his eyes, and if you know Tom, he's kind of an emotional guy. That's what I love about him. He is Irish. <laughs> but he looked at me, he said, no, he said, no, Chris, you got it all wrong. He said, thank you for letting me serve, because serving saved my life. There's another person, she's not here today. I wish she was. I probably should have told her I was going to talk about her, but then maybe she wouldn't have come. But I, you, you all know her as Diane. I know her as the coffee lady, okay? And what Diane does faithfully every weekend, before our Saturday services, before our Sunday services, she comes up here long before anybody else is here, and she works hard to prepare what all of us know we need because we're addicted to it, the stuff called coffee that we can't live without, right? Which we probably need to pray for deliverance, but it is what it is. God made it, so it must be all right which some people are saying, I know some other things that God made, but that we're not going there. <laughs> not going there. <laughs> Your word's not mine. <laughs> but she comes up here and she, she, she faithfully provides coffee so that we can have our fresh cup of coffee, which enables us to worship God better, right? And I was talking to her recently. She was actually serving again because this woman is, this is just who she is. She was serving at a memorial service that we were hosting here at the church. And I said, Diane, I just want to thank you for your continual faithfulness to serve the body of Christ. And she again looked at me and she goes, no, no, no. It's my privilege to serve. One more person. There's a, a, a guy by the name of David Miller. Some of you might know that David recently has been diagnosed with terminal cancer. He was on treatment for a while. It was, it was too hard for him. He didn't like the, having the low quality of life, and so he took himself off the treatment. He's just trusting God for healing. You can pray with him and for him. 
but he also has this overwhelming peace. He told me, I remember the day I was sitting in the hospital and there's this peace that just came over me that however it works out, whether God heals me or he takes me home, I'm good. And if you know anything about David, that's huge. Those of you that know David, that, that's huge. And I'm telling you right now, as a witness, it is a God peace, not a David peace. But recently he called me up and he said, you know what, I got to thinking, I was sitting here in my chair and he said, I, I want to make the best and the biggest impact I can make for the kingdom of God before God takes me home. So I was wondering, could I just call people that are maybe in the hospital or could I just call people that are stuck in their homes? Can I just call them and encourage them? And so we're like, yeah, Dennis gave him some, some numbers to call. And this week I went over to his house to visit him. I was talking to him and he had this big smile on his face. He got, I got to talk to somebody. And, and, and I just got to just, just encourage them and pray for them over the phone. And, and he said, I just want to say thank you for letting me serve. Because it's so good to know that if God takes me home, and this is the last few months I have, that I could glorify God by using my ability to encourage others. So what I'm, what I'm saying to you is this. You have gifts and talents that God wants to use. In fact... If you're not using those, you truly are robbing yourself of the blessing of seeing what God wants to and can do through your life. And I'm not, I'm not telling you these things to try to coerce you or encourage you or any of that. I mean, maybe I am trying to encourage you, but I'm not trying to coerce you. I'm telling you these things because I've seen it time and time again. That when we get outside of ourselves and we allow God to use what he has gifted us with, whatever that might be, he uses us to deposit love and make a difference in other people's lives. In fact, here's how we'll close. Okay, that, that was exactly 10 minutes. So give me five more. <laughs> give me five more, all right? <laughs> If you want to see a change in your marriage, love your spouse and watch as God changes you and changes them. You want to see a change in your friendships, love and serve your friends unconditionally and watch as God brings that change. You want to see a change in your community, love your community without condition and watch as God brings that change. You, you want to see people in your life passionate about Jesus? Be passionate about Jesus. You want to see a change in your own life? Ask God to give you eyes to see, ears to hear, a heart that cares, and watch as he changes lives through you. And the first life that he changes is you. It never ceases to amaze me that when Jesus, the King of Kings, God in the flesh, came to this earth, that he had this response to us. He said, I did not come to be served, but to serve. I, I did not come to be cared for, I came to care. I did not come to be served, I came to serve. I came to show you love without condition. And so I think our only reasonable response to what our Savior has done for us is to say, that's what you did, this is what I will do. You have loved me without condition, therefore I will love without condition. Would you bow your heads with me today? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. God, it is living, it is active, it, it speaks to our hearts, it challenges us. It shows us a better way to live. And, and so, Lord, I pray for your people today. I believe with all of our heart, our desire, our intent is to become more like you. And so I ask, God, that you would give us, each and every one of us, eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart that cares for those who are hurting. 
And Father, as you reveal to us those, those opportunities, those privileges that you are giving us, Lord, I pray that you would infuse us with power, that you would give us wisdom and anointing to represent you so that the world might know that you are God, that you love and that you care and that you can bring hope to each and every life. God, that you would empower us through your spirit to be your instruments that show others who you are as we follow the example that you yourself laid out for us. I pray also, God, for those in this room today, that as they look at their life, they, they might say, you know what I need is I need to know the unconditional love of the Father. And God, I'm so thankful that you loved us so much. It was not easy, but you were willing to do it. You sent your one and only son to this earth to do for us what we could have never done for ourselves. Jesus, you willingly died on a cross, were buried in a grave, and rose again, all so that you could be the penalty of our sins and offer us new life. And so, Lord, it's because of that truth, and it's by that reality, by that hope and that truth that, that you have provided it for us, Lord, that, that we can put our faith in you, that it's nothing that we can do to earn our way or achieve our way or measure up. It's really just believing and receiving that what you did on the cross paid the penalty of our sins, that you, by, by raising from the dead, offering us new life, that we can establish that relationship, we can know that the old is gone and the new has come through simple faith in you. And so I pray for those today, God, that would say, that's the desire of my heart. I want to know Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. I want to experience the forgiveness and the newness of life that is available to me. Lord, I thank you that it's not special words or magical prayers. It's really just a posture of our heart where we recognize our need of a Savior. We recognize that you are the Savior. And we experience the saving grace that you alone can bring to our lives. Father, I pray that you would make that a reality in those who are seeking after you today. And we thank you for the change that you alone can bring to our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray.